This is an interview at Division of Military and Naval Affairs Headquarters, Latham, New York, June 5th, 2003, approximately 9.30 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Yeah, my name is Oliver M. Santos, C-S-O-N-T-O-S. -O -S. Uh, my date of birth was 7-17-23. I was born in Detroit, Michigan. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering military service? Well, I went to grammar school and high school, and I went to School of Aviation Trades, which I didn't graduate from, but it was two and a half years, and I went right into the service at age 18. Okay. Um, where were you, and what do you remember when you heard about Pearl Harbor? What I was, was just after? coming back from leave Thanksgiving. I was stationed at Dowfield, Bangor, Maine. And I was coming back, I was on the bus in Boston when I heard the boy shouting extras and I looked out the window and I saw Pearl Harbor bomb. That's where I was. And I was heading back to my base up in Maine. Yeah, I reached the base the following morning and there were guards all around, but I had no problem. We got in and there was a big buzz going on of what we were going to do. Nobody was sure of what we were going to do. And then we started packing, okay, and uh, we packed up, boxed up the... This was the 43rd Bomb Group. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, you entered service prior to... Uh, I went in July 22nd. Okay. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Okay. Yeah. Well, why did you select the Air Force? Because Air Force. I had gone to a School of Aviation mm -hmm. Trades. No, well, why did you go there? Did you... To the Air Force? To the Air... the Trade School, the Air Trade School. Well, I was interested in aviation. Had you ever flown? No, no, but I was very much interested. Okay. I was, made models as a youngster mm -hmm. and whatnot, you know. Okay. And uh, I went to this school because I originally intended to, to be a pilot, mm -hmm. you know. Got into the Air Force, but it didn't turn out that way. So in, when we got to Dow Field, I got back to the field. Uh, we packed up, and uh, it was several weeks later, we all got on a train and went to Boston, Massachusetts, and there we got on to the Queen Mary, 12,000 troops, okay, four sittings of meals, four, four groups, okay. And then we took off from uh, Boston and we sailed down the coast. We got into the Gulf of Mexico and we refueled and resupplied ourselves. And from there we went down to Rio de Janeiro, and again, refueled and resupplied. Now, were you in a convoy or a single ship? No, it was a single ship because the Queen Mary was quite fast and they didn't think the subs could catch us. So we got into Rio de Janeiro Harbor, refueled and restored ourselves and we stayed there a day or two and then we got across to the Cape Town, Africa. And this whole trip took about 40 days. We got to Cape Town, Africa again, resupplied and everything came around to Cape Horn and got through the Indian Ocean, which was, we went through a horrendous storm. Even the English crew were quite concerned because we were tipping. They thought we would heal over, you know. Mm -hmm. We got into the west coast of Australia, Friedmantle, Australia. We were there a day or two, I don't know how long. And then we came around the Straits, came up to Sydney, and we were bivouacked in the uh, racetrack. We had big burlap bags with straw <laughs> for, for mattresses, and that's where we stayed, you know. Mm -hmm. And then we went on from there. I got several places that we went to. We went up the, the coast of Australia, stayed in different areas, and uh, finally we wound up in the very northern part of Australia where we hooked up with our B-17s. Now, we, how are the B-17s for our class? I'm not sure. I imagine they were flown across... Mm -hmm with the larger uh, fuel tanks because mm -hmm. their, their fuel capacity wasn't that great to make a flight completely across. So we picked them up there and then we formed our groups. We had headquarters squadron, 63rd, 4th, and 5th. And we started flying missions out of the northern part of Australia. Did you, now, were you with the same crew the entire time? No, no, no. We were with different crews at different times. I was on various positions and uh, we flew bombing runs up into the different islands of uh, Rabaul, Weewak, Milne Bay, 
all of these areas. Here's some more of the photos if you're interested. Okay, why don't you hold these up uh, to the camera and tell us a little bit about them. Oh, this is our crew of the Blackjack. On uh, this one, I was uh, tail gunner, I think, at the time. We're about to you. <laughs> I'm right here. <laughs> now, now, did you name that plane? No, that was named already. Mm -hmm. I guess the crews got together and named mm -hmm. it all, you know. Mm -hmm. so. can, can you hold, uh, just hold that momentarily, if you would. Okay. Okay. Now tell us about that one. That's a different plane, isn't it? No, it's the same oh, blackjack from a different oh, okay. different angle. See, oh, this right. is the okay, one side different. and this is oh, the other okay. side. Okay, why don't you show the other side because the nose decoration is a little yeah, different. Yeah, a little different and it, yeah. it uh, showed up all our bombing runs and whatnot, you know. Okay. Oh, yeah, I see that. Um, now, where are you in that second picture? Down here at the bottom. Okay. Okay. Oh, can, you, can you hold that? Yeah. Down here at the bottom. Okay. Thank you. Now, in the uh, bombing runs in the, in the Pacific, did you receive a lot of flack when you, you went into the bombing runs? Yes, we did receive a lot of flack. We received all kinds of flack enemy aircraft. These are all the crews that we had and the pilots and many of our guys didn't come back. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I had some stuff here. Now you were th with the 5th Air Force then? Yes. Okay. Um, what, were, what was the majority of your mission? What kind of targets? Well, Japanese airports a lot of uh, shipping transports. We had to hit the Bismarck Sea battle where I got some of the stuff here. We hit the Bismarck Sea battle and we sunk I don't know how many transports. And it was because of this that our crew was, most of the crew was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, mm -hmm. as I was too. But uh, we hit uh, the uh, Huron Gulf, Bismarck Sea Battle, Milne Bay, all of these ports where the Japanese were for a good while. Mm -hmm. And we were bombing transports and we hit an awful lot of uh, transports, Japanese transports, and we sunk them. Now what was it like to uh, a bomber against a, a ship? Uh, well, can you describe that? We were, say, maybe 10,000 feet, and uh, it was up to the bombardier and navigator to get us in position. Mm -hmm. and of course, we experienced a lot of flak ag from, mm -hmm. from the ships, and we tried to drop. We, in fact, we did uh, sink a destroyer, and we tried to sink a couple of cruisers. But then, uh, because of the, the probability of hitting ships from that height with, with the smaller bombs, we developed what they call skip bombing. Now this is a, a thing where you come in, say, maybe 500 feet over the water, and you're heading at a, at a ship, a transport, and you're maybe 1,000 feet from the transport, and you drop your bombs. And they skip along the water, and then, of course, we peel away, and these bombs make a definite hit on the side of the transports, and that's how we developed that, and we sunk a good number of ships. That, in fact, one transport, we, we dropped the bomb and it skipped over the, the transport and then hit a destroyer on the other side. So we were good that way. And now this is with a B-17 you came in like The B-17s were flying fortresses and they were really terrific ships, best okay. ever. We came home. I'll give you a summary of maybe one of them. 24th, we were ordered to attack a convoy. Now this is the 24th of one, sir. Uh, November 24th, possibly in mm -hmm. 42. Mm -hmm. Okay, we were ordered to attack a convoy of five destroyers coming presumably to lay. Part of our bombs were fused with four second delays and the others were at one tenth second delays. We spotted the convoy, climbed about 3,500 feet, cut our throttles, RPM back, and made our first skip bombing run at 200 feet at 255 miles an hour. 
The bombs just hit off the end of the boat and the ak, -ak hit in the tail gunner's ammunition can exploding about 70 shells. A fire started and then we uh, rushed back and put out the fire. The next run of skip bomb, our bomb hit directly on or very near the boat starting a fire and on the right side of the ship. This time the radio operator and two more men were injured but not seriously. And there were a number of flights like that. That's, mm -hmm. that's the way we, we did it, you know. Now, you uh, mentioned here in the forum, you filled out, you were a flight engineer, but you also served in gun positions also? Yes, I, I, I started as, as a tail gunner, okay, mm -hmm. when I first got onto the cruise. And then I went up to assistant engineer. And because of my background with the School of Aviation Trades and, and everything that I learned at that trade school, they gave in the Army, but I already had. So in that way, they promoted me up to the top turn as flight engineer. And in this, I assisted the pilot, co-pilot, uh, adjusting the throttles, uh, pitch propellers, and transferring fuel from tank to tank so that they would be balanced out. One instance is where we hit Milne Bay, and uh, we skip-bombed a, a ship there, too, and we turned around, come back, and we hit some storms, very bad storms. And, we didn't think we were going to make it, and we were running out of fuel. <laughs> so uh, we're looking for the first place to land that we could, and as we're coming into an emergency strip, because our fuel was that low, and our ball turn operator had the guns down, and he's trying to get them back up. They were jammed, so I came down from the top turn to try and help him look, get that gun back up, but, but we couldn't do it. And finally the pilot says, we've got to come in because we're out of fuel. So as we're starting the approach coming in, on, it was midnight and the storm was horrendous, okay. Finally the turret was able to be jacked up and we landed safely. We taxied to the end of the runway and the engine stopped. We were out of fuel. So that was one of the things. We refueled from 50-gallon tanks and then flew back to Port Moresby. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of instances like that where, where we were through a lot of electrical storms down there too. One of them I remember well because we were at about 10,000 feet and the plane was all encompassed with St. Elmo's fire. Oh, wow. The propeller tips, the, air, uh, the antennas, the, the edges of the... And we were going along and we dropped from 10,000 feet to about 2,000 feet, looking out alongside the pilot and co-pilot. The, the wings of the B-17 must have curled up about two feet or so. Something like, it seemed like it, unbelievable. We dropped down to 2,000 feet and then stopped. Now, in the back, one of the assistant engineers was holding on to this railing that was a guide rail, and he was holding it on with two hands, and he held on so tight that when we stopped, he pulled that whole thing right down <laughs> into a big U shape. <laughs> so that was, quite a, that was quite an experience. And we had a number of other experiences like that. And one time, where we were going along, we were on a reconnaissance mission. And we were hit by seven Zeeks. These are the bigger type zeros, I believe. And uh, the ship that we took wasn't our own B-17. It was an older B-17 that we used for reconnaissance missions. <clears throat> and we were flying along, and these Zeeks spotted us, and they came, and they attacked us. They hit us from the front, the side, the back. And unfortunately, none of our guns operated. We had one 30 caliber gun that was able to fire the rest. The 50 calibers, the shells were jammed. They were old shells, split casings, and we could not shoot. So there was one Zeke coming in off of our right wing, and I was in the top turret, and I had the, the sights on him, and I thought, well, I can maybe get this guy. His leading edge was like on fire from the, 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 the shoot, shooting, you know. So as he's coming in close, I tried to fire. My guns wouldn't fire, okay. So I didn't know what was the matter. So I grabbed the, the cables to eject the shells or to put new shells in, and I kept doing that several times, and he's still coming in on us. And he went overhead, and he missed us completely, and I couldn't get him, but I lifted up the casings of the 50 calibers, and there was a slug in each one of the chambers, a 50 caliber slug, and there was also one in the, in the bolt, and I was slamming them. <laughs> I thought my head would be blown up, and, and my legs, my knees turned to water, and I sat down on the turret, and I, I just couldn't move for a couple of minutes. 
But I think it was at that at that mission there that the, we got a flak hit, and the the, the pilot was uh, got flak in his left thigh. And because we couldn't fire, shoot our guns, the only evasive tactic we could take was to get down low on the water. Now the Zeeks had firepower, but their firepower wasn't as great as ours. So to reach us, they had to get in real close, and getting down low on the water, they had to pull out before they could actually hit us with any, any kind of firing. We were that low on the water that we put four wakes into the water from the propellers. And standing where I was, I could look into the bomb bay, and the bomb bays don't close tight. I could see sprays of water coming up. We were that, that down. That was the only way we could get away from them. You know. And we had other missions. The mission that we, uh, <clears throat> we had there that we received the... Uh, I received, anyhow, Distinguished Flying Cross, as did the crew members. Let me just ask you something. Uh, were there any repercussions? Did anybody get in trouble because those guns didn't work? You better believe it, they got in trouble. We chewed and chewed on people, that were the armament people that were supposed to take care of. Well, there was an older ship and just used primarily for reconnaissance. Those guns were supposed to be working and working well, you know. Now, were those guns supposed to be cleaned daily, like after every mission? As on the reg on our regular ships, yes, we'd come down. We pre-fired all the guns when we, as soon as we got up, mm -hmm. pre-fired them all to make sure they were. But this time, for some reason or other, we didn't because we were on this easy recon missions, which didn't turn out to be too easy, you know. So uh, I got. Something here. How many missions were you on total? Well, I flew officially 51 missions. Mm -hmm. Actually, I flew 53. Not the waters there, so. Yeah, actually, I flew 53. <coughs> but the pilot that I was with at that time <coughs> had been ill and had been in a hospital, so he was lacking the amount of missions that he needed. He needed about two more, and I had 51 at the time, so he asked me, he said, would I finish up with him? And I said, geez, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to push this too much, you know. So I did fly the last two missions with him, which was a total of 53. But they credited me for 51, which was fine, you know, no problem there. <coughs> now, um, did you wear a flak, <coughs> flak jacket at all? No, we had no. We didn't wear our shoots or flak jackets, mm -hmm. nothing. We just uh, flew our regular cover. Now, you had them in the plane, though? Or? Oh, everything was in the plane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the parachutes were in the plane. And Flag jackets, mm -hmm. were, but we, we never really wore them because sometimes they were cumbersome and whatnot, yeah. you know. Now, did you have to wear the thermal suits like they did in Europe? No, no, because our altitudes weren't as high. Mm -hmm. I think in Europe they went up to 20, 25,000 yes, feet. Yeah. Rarely we went up to 20 because then you'd have to take oxygen, but mm -hmm. because of our area, we were more flying more in the 10, 15,000 foot range, mm -hmm. you know. Did you ever wear, uh, did you ever have the leather jackets? We always had leather jackets. We had the fur line leather Did you uh, decorate yours at all? No. No. Did they decorate them in the Pacific? Were there a lot that decorated them? Or? The, fur, the leather jackets? Yes. No, no. I don't recall any of our people being decorated with leather, with, on their leather, mm -hmm. leather jackets. General Kinney uh, decorated us. We were all in line with the DFC. And the well, I meant, well, you know, putting on uh, painting things on your jacket, like your plane. Oh, I don't recall the emblems. Bomb, you mean. Uh, the emblems. And, no, I don't recall yeah, any I, of that. I was just wondering, no. because a lot of the European uh, Yeah, I know. They did, did that. that. We, we didn't do that. Uh -huh. uh, can I read you a small sure. ex excerpt from this? On um, episode uh, occurred February 14th. This was the night raid on Jabal. Uh, our plane harassed the enemy and drew anti-aircraft fire so that the other bombers in the formation could make their runs without interference. The situation read, this sacrifice was a great risk and the bomber narrowly missed being forced into the sea. That was us. One engine was put out of commission by a concentration of Jap batteries, but the B-17 leveled off and made its own bombing run over the target. The second part of the exploit unfolded on the return flight to home base somewhere in Australia the plane encountered, we encountered one of those terrific mid-summer tropical storms and was hit by lightning. A second engine was damaged and the radio was made useless, so we went home about on one and a half engines, I guess. Gasoline supply began to run low, the ship bucked the storm, and uh, so forth. But we, 
got home okay, and that was the, that was the deal there. There are other you know instances where this gives you a great account of what what the different uh, missions we had and, and the and the, uh, the pilots and the. Uh, um, what? Uh, how long were you out in the Pacific? Well, we got down there. I think it was uh, we were on on the ship on the Queen Mary 40 days, so we landed, I think, sometime in March. I'm not sure, just mm -hmm. the dates now. And then I came home in November of 40, 44, 43. Mm -hmm. So that's a good 18 to 20 months I was down in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Now, you were still in the service until uh, July of 45. What did you do when you returned to the States? Well, I had, uh, I got, recommendations from all the pilots I went to uh, flight cadet school. I signed up uh, as mm -hmm. a flight cadet, but at that time they weren't training many pilots. So we were, they were just, we were status quo more or less, mm -hmm. you know. So I decided instead of just being status quo, I resigned the, the flight cadet session. And then I was sent up to uh, West Overfield, Massachusetts as a flight chief, as a crew chief. Mm -hmm servicing planes. That's that's where we were. Not much else, I think, you know, but... Uh, can you? Okay, what was uh, your reaction when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Where were you and what was your reaction? President Roosevelt? Yes. I can't tell you. I don't okay. remember. I don't remember that at all, where, mm -hmm. I, where, where I was or what my reaction was at that How time. How about the... Did you have a reaction to the dropping of the atomic bombs? Well, I don't know. Uh, it was, of course, it saved a great many American lives. I mm -hmm. guess that was the idea of it, to save as many lives as we could. And I think in the, in the final analysis, President uh, Truman did the right thing, mm -hmm. even though it was really devastating for the Japanese people. But uh, they, I don't think without that bomb dropping that they had any intention of surrendering as quickly as they did. But that was that was it, I guess. You know, as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever get to see any USO shows? I don't think so. I don't, because in in the Pacific, in the New Guinea, there that yeah. it was nothing like that that yeah. I, that I can recall yeah. that we had any US, US shows like that for any of us. You know, so. Now I noticed that you said that you were. Uh, you were injured or wounded your left knee and your right foot. Was that? That was, yeah, I was injured even before I went overseas when we were up in Bangor, Maine. We were loading uh, big boxes and my leg got caught and twisted and I pulled my knee. And it was pretty bad, but I decided just to let it go and stay with my outfit. When I was overseas, I injured it a second time and busted my foot, both feet. And uh, I was in the hospital for a month or two, but the doctor said they would send me home, but I said, no, I'd rather go back to my outfit. Mm -hmm. I thought if I had a problem, I could take care of it when I got home, mm -hmm. which is what I did. I went back to the outfit after that, and and, uh, and I've got that service disability because because of the first knee, the second knee went bad, and I got steel pins inside my left foot, and my right foot is slightly malformed because of the injuries that I received while I was in the jungle, you know. Mm -hmm. Did you have any uh, problem with jungle diseases, like uh, dengue fever, malaria? Anything? No, they gave us malaria pills. They gave us uh, yellow, yellow pills uh, for malaria. Mm -hmm. But we did have, uh, on occasions, uh, you'd have fevers. I had fevers at different times, like that, from the jungles and whatnot, you know. But it was a crazy outfit we had over there, because one time the, uh, the flight surgeon but a psychiatrist through our, we were in, in pyramidal tents living in the jungles, okay. And the temperature was about 100, 110 degrees. And he brought the psychiatrist through. Uh, we were there, I guess, maybe about a year or so and had been flying. He brought this psychiatrist through and they're looking at us and here, we knew they were coming through, okay. So we all put on this heavy wool jackets, okay. And we built a big bonfire. And we all stood around it, heating our hands like, you know, oh, it's great, oh, yeah, good to be warm, you know. 
And they're watching us, you know, so after a while when the psychiatrist was leaving, the flight surgeon asked, what do you think of the outfit? He says, I haven't seen a sane man in here yet, you know. So that was, that was one of the things. But we had a great time. We used to get leaves. We used to go down to Sydney, Australia, <coughs> come back up again and fly. Unfortunately, we did lose a number of our people that were shot down, knocked down, crashed. Captain McCullough was one of the greatest and unfortunately, uh, he left 63rd Squad and went into, I think, the 64th. Really shaped him up, took off one day, and I guess his wheel well or something was on fire, and he pulled up and pulled up and he crashed and he was killed. That was one of the better pilots over there. What was his first name? Uh, Kenneth, I think, was his first name. It's in here someplace. Um, what do you think, how do you think your... Uh experience in service changed or affected your life? Well, it was a terrific experience. It was worth a million dollars, but I tell you, it wouldn't take a million to go through it again. I don't think it affected my life too much. I got married before we got out of the service, of course, from my childhood bride. And, uh, no, I, I uh, the thing of it was because of I had an incident that, that happened to me because I was on leave and I was up in New York City in the Bronx and I was walking across the street and my knee would give out on me completely and I'd have to manipulate it, circuit it and do all kinds of things to get it so I could walk again. So I said, gee, this is pretty bad. I'll turn myself into the hospital and I was on leave. So I got into the hospital and this was not a good story. The doctors were very nice. They put me in a bed, and the next morning the, the doctors came around, and this colonel came around at the same time, and he said, what's this guy doing here? He says, well, he, his knee is bad, and he was on leave. He says, he's on leave, and he's coming in here now? They said, yes. He says, throw him the hell out of here. That was a bad experience for me, and I says, after all, being overseas and coming through all this to, to get that kind of a response from even a colonel wasn't necessary. And things kind of soured me. All the, uh, the formalities of the service kind of soured me. So that's why I didn't stay in the service. And that's kind of soured me on airplanes, too, as far as that goes. But overseas, it was really very informal. The, the, the captains, the, the, the lieutenants were great guys. We were all just one good crew, you know, and we respected one another, and that was it. Did you join any veterans organizations when you returned home? I was in the DAV down in Florida for a while, but and then I didn't continue. Mm -hmm. And I was on leave in Sydney when the orders came through, and I didn't expect it to. F we were relieved to fly back home, mm -hmm. and they had sent all my stuff down as much as they could. I had a few souvenirs, odds and ends, and but I never got them. So uh, from Sydney, we went to New Zealand, stopped there, and then went up to one of the islands to refuel. And then from there, we went on up to Hawaii, where we refueled. We stayed there for about two weeks in Hawaii. They had to put in two big Bombay tanks so that we could make the flight to Frisco. And we took off one night from Hawaii and landed in Frisco the next morning straight through. That was a good experience. We were going to, we saw the, uh, the bridge, the uh, Golden, Gate. Golden Gate Bridge, and the, and the crew were yelling to the pilot, let's go underneath it, let's buzz it. <laughs> pilot said, no way are we going to do that. He said, there may be cables hanging from that thing. He says, we come this far, we're not going down now. But we did buzz it, and we landed at Hamilton Field, and, and then from there we got orders. We dropped our B-17 off at Oklahoma, and from there I got a ride with a general up to Ohio on the ride, and from there I got some other rides up into New York City to, to see my family. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, ever stay in contact with anyone that you uh, served with? Yes, my ball turret operator, Bill Donahue, was my best man, and I did stay in touch with several of the guys. Unfortunately, two of our crew, uh, Lefty Keehan and Tom Hickey, that came back with us, again, all the formalities here and whatnot, they decided they would go over to England and fly as a flight crew in England on B-17s. That's the 8th Air Force. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they never made it back. Okay. Um, did you ever use the GI Bill? 
Yes, for training. I did uh, different kinds of job training and whatnot. And I went to agricultural school, and on a GI Bill, I got into the jewelry trade, and but nothing ever developed of it for me. Mm -hmm. And we got into farming and whatnot. And, you know, then I got out of that, and then I got into the state, and uh, I was a heating and ventilating engineer assistant. In, was a heating and ventilating engineer. Did you ever use that fifty-two twenty clock? You got to refresh me. What it, it was? It was uh, fifty-two weeks, twenty dollars a week, kind of an unemployment. Uh... I don't think I did. Did I, Nan? I did. Yeah, I did. I guess I did. She says, "Yeah, yeah." I guess I did. You know. Okay. How about uh, telling us uh, you wrote down when these were taken? Where were those photographs taken? First these were taken, and this one was taken in Bangor, Maine. Okay. This one was taken in Australia. We were on leave at the time. I was down in Sydney, and we had this photo taken, sent back to my folks. Mm -hmm. But this was up at Dow Field. How about these? These are different ones than we saw earlier. Yeah, this was uh, this was uh, several of the crews. This was our crew down here, and this is me right here. Okay, and these were I think 63rd, 64th. This was the 63rd bomb mm -hmm. group. And uh, this was in this this book that my wife purchased. It was uh, it was the entire crew and flight happenings down in the Pacific of the Fifth Air Force. Okay. And how about this? Have to get that one in. This is just before we were married. It was a child bride. Uh -huh. <laughs> Where were you married? New York City. New York City. Yeah, okay. New York City. We were married there. And and that was in uh, May 19th. And this past May, uh, I guess we have 58 years anniversary. So yeah, this was us. We were both much slimmer at the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, well, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. This one. Well, there were a lot of other things, well, but you, you. you can't remember them all. Yeah. No. Um, you know, we we should make a copy of that. Uh, well, those two photographs you have of the the crews. Could I look at this, please? 